Welcome to another edition of 30 with Tony, the show that pulls no punches and tells it exactly like it is. Today, we are not going to disappoint you. We are going to take it from the top, and we are going to make it hurt. So let's get it on. Sock it to me, baby. Misabis, it's Tony D'Angelo. It is March 7th, 2024, out of Domini in the year of our Lord. So happy to have you here today. So happy for each of you. Very grateful to you and our music contributors and all the people that have made this an incredible and wonderful journey for me. So incredibly grateful for all the support you've given me here and on the Lee Elsie Show and on Twitter X and as I said in the promo, we're going to get right down to it. I'm so angry I'm splitting nickels. The state of Connecticut has some incredible liars in its state-run media, in its administration, and in its political parties. And I'm going to give you something today that you really need to start asking questions about because this is nothing but a sham and a charade and all at your expense. And we're going to show you exactly what's taking place. Now, a little bit of background. For those of you that have followed this show, you know I have been chronicling the saga of Scott Franklin. Scott Franklin, on or about June 12, 2023, was reported to have vandalized the Black Lives Matter mural at Bushnell Park in Hartford, Connecticut. And we've had our questions. We're going to review those. We've had our questions about this, and we've had some very serious questions that no one's really dealing with. And we're going to bring this full circle for you today as to what actually takes place in Connecticut. And when I look at something like this that I'm about to show you, the political parties, both of them are involved. The state-run media is involved. The administrative state is involved, and they don't want you to know the truth. 
So today we're going to show you the truth and how race is used as a weapon against the well-meaning citizen in the state of Connecticut. Allow me to share, allow me to elucidate. And I'm just going to go over to here, if I may. And here we go. Now, the um, screen that we're looking at is a December 2nd, 2023 screen capture of prisoner Scott Franklin, who is being incarcerated in Hartford. He's been in jail at this time. He's been on the dock at seven times. He's been in jail about uh, over six months here. He's charged with three offenses. One is a felony. We're going to look at that in a moment. Uh, bias and bigotry and with damage. And he pleads not guilty to each of the three. And the I kept asking the question that what did this man do if he did anything at all that entitles him to a jail cell for six months? Now, to look at the actual, quote unquote, the proof text, very grateful to our colleague, George Colley, who called all of our attention to this. This is Bushnell Park, apparently, in the night of the offense. This is the video or video capture taken from Channel 3. And if you look at this, um, what do you see? What's happening? You might see two people here, maybe. But are they doing anything or is those just shadows? We really don't know. I mean, we have no conclusive proof of anything. As I have said before, and I will say again, this looks like a piece of moldy toast with butter that somebody left out on the uh, the screen porch table overnight and, you know, a bunch of ants got to it. Um, you can't convict anything or anyone on that. But yet the state run media took this and they made a cause celeb ostensibly at the dictates of Senators Duff, Looney, Blumenthal, Lamont and everybody else that we have this horrible racial thing happening. And we, you know, we've got to eradicate racism. And this is what we do in Connecticut because we're racially sensitive people. And we're going to, you know, jump on this guy 37 ways from Tuesday. Now, I do not know this man. This man may have horrible racial, uh, shall we say, biases. But I believe in the law. And I believe that, you know, obviously there had to be something here because the guy's been in jail all this time and nobody's really saying what in the heck they did. And there's been no conclusive proof in, uh, of anything up until March 1st. So again, I'm going to show you here. I want you to study. This was the case docket. And this statute here, we're going to look at in a moment, 53A, 116A3 was the operative felony statute. Okay, we're going to continue here to share. And uh, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to here. I'm going to shut that down. I'm going to come back to my Zoom and I'm going to go to here. And uh, I uh, let me just see if I can do this. I'm going to stop the share. How about that? And then we're going to share again. And a funny thing happened, as I was saying, on March 1st, 2024. Here is the judicial branch criminal record of Scott Franklin. This is as of March 2nd, 2024. And Scott Franklin, the misdemeanor charges go away. Ostensibly, he pleads to a felony. He has a fine of $1,000 and he's got two years in jail. Uh, for something which is very doubtful if he did at all. Now, if you look at that statute, 53A181KA2, let's get that up. I've highlighted it here. I'm just going to move my mug. I know you can't see my mug. But they charged him with the two part. Damages, destroys, or defaces any real or personal property of such other group of persons or threatens by word of act to do an act described in subsection one or two of this section. Now, again, the Black Lives Matter mural is not the property of Black Lives Matter. It is municipal property. And 
the uh, you have to in order to get at this group of persons, you've got to destroy their property. It's not their property. And then threatens by word of act to do an act described the subdivision one or two of the subject section. He's walking with black people, you know. So what in the hell is going on here? What did we have happening with this man nine months in jail? And what does the man get? He gets a two-year paid vacation, three hots and a cot, computer tablet, videos, telephone, safety, off the streets for something that could have been adjudicated a month later and really, for all intents and purposes, was a vandalism charge. Now, if you look at the amenities for the incarcerated, this is an old Republican um, article from a number of years ago. They've only gotten better. One question that is often asked is, do inmates, especially those at the higher security facilities, have access to televisions or other electronic devices? The simple answer is yes. According to the DOC, inmates at the high security prisons can buy items from the commissary, a radio, CD player, television, or even electronic games. Uh, they even get a minimal stipend, and then they get, uh, you know, uh, let's just see, here we go down. Um, they, um, they can have private visitation, and by pr providing inmates with these, I'll be better off reading this, I think, by providing inmates with these incentives and keeping them engaged in activities, it helps to keep order, provide a safer environment for those who oversee these persons. Uh, for more information, this is a good thing. And now they've got uh, telephones uh, with the uh, consent of, uh, or shall I say, the consent of the state and uh, provided by uh, the wonderful Securus Technologies. So we've got Mr. Franklin. And Mr. Franklin here, by doing something, something that is totally unclear, gets a two-year paid vacation off the streets, all his meals and whatever. So what the hell's happening here? What the hell is happening here? Is everything that I'm showing you is purported to be this horrible racial crime but this man's getting very well rewarded for doing, in effect, absolutely nothing. And, you know, it's it's if he really did what you said he did, why is there not a clear video of it? And why have this man plead guilty and then send him somewhere for two years at state expense? For really what was an act of vandalism? What what went on here? Did Senators Duff and Looney go to the state-run media and say, we're going to have this racial event? Did somebody give this guy, you know, 500 bucks and say, look, play along, and then you're going to find yourself in a very comfortable prison for a couple of years if you do? I mean, if you look at the poor man, he sadly doesn't have anything else going on in his life by appearances sake. So, there's a lot taking place here that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And if he really was this horrible criminal, why did you wait to incarcerate him? Why didn't you start the clock in his incarceration? Why didn't you put him in something like solitary confinement for his deepest, darkest thoughts so he'll never commit racism again? This is absolutely unbelievable. Who's in on this tackle? I mean, notice that the, uh, the misdemeanors went away. And uh, they, you know, normally you plead to a misdemeanor so you could get out in a short period of time. The misdemeanors here go away. This guy pleads to a felony because it uh, entitles him to safekeeping for two years, three hots and a cot videos and, you know, safe place to be. I mean, to me, it really smacks of a job well done. I mean, prove me wrong, prove me otherwise. And I mean, if he did something horrible, why can't we see a clear video? I mean, case is over. You know, he's got a public defender here, Mr. V Velodota, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. What's up, Mr. Velodota? Did he plead to something just so this whole thing can go away and he could enter into the kingdom of the state? Something doesn't really work out here, especially the timing right before Juneteenth. 
the offense date was a week before, right? Seven days before June Juneteenth, so that we can work this into a big racial incident. This whole thing has got to be a racial fraud prop perpetuated on the citizens of the state of Connecticut. If it is not a racial fraud prop precipitated on the persons of the state of Connecticut, come on this show and explain to me where I'm wrong. You know, Marty Looney, Bob Duff, Ned Lamont, state-run media, come here and tell me, this really is a crock. A man goes and maybe does something, possibly, the statute doesn't even fit the crime, and then he's off on a paid vacation that we're all paying for, and then we've got to read more state-run media blather, crap, pap, nonsense, probably the next Juneteenth, when you find yourself another pigeon to do this in Hartford. This is absolutely unbelievable. This is the shame of the state of Connecticut. They lie, they cheat, they fabricate. And I don't know how to make it any plainer than that. But what I do need to know is what, what really went on here. And if I'm lying, people are watching this video cast. More and more people are watching it. You need to come on, state-connected person, and tell me what the heck happened here? Show me a clear video. Show me this wasn't a prop racial event because every single thing that you do, honestly, your frauds that you try to perpetuate on people. I had one with an administrative state yesterday. Perhaps I'll share that at another point in time. I mean, they're bad frauds. They're very easily figured out. You think people are dumber than you are. Well, guess what? They're not. And a lot of them are just things that, you know, I've seen in gangster movies going back, you know, watching movies in the 1930s and 1940s. This is life in Connecticut. It's a shame upon the citizens. It's a shame upon every single person who's involved in this drawing a state paycheck or somehow connected with the state-run media. This is nothing but a crock and a sham. And it's about time there was an explanation. Meanwhile, if Mr. Franklin, if you're watching this, enjoy your stay, enjoy your sojourn, courtesy of the citizens of the state of Connecticut. I guess we're more than happy to provide comfortable housing. And, and think of it, you know, how many people are on the streets being thrown out of their apartments or living somewhere, you know, maybe not like illegals in luxury hotels, but, you know, uh, they can't pay the rent. And, you know, they would consider doing something, maybe possibly, maybe not doing a little bit of vandalism here to get themselves a paid vacation. I mean, I think there's something wrong in going to jail personally, but a lot of people, you know, wouldn't necessarily agree with me if they could do it. And then, you know, maybe they can go and do it again and get five years. I mean, this is absolutely insane. I mean, you know, Lord help me, you explain to me because I, I if, 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 if this adds up, um, I, uh, I've got to be the stupidest guy on the planet to think that somebody would actually think that somebody watching this would believe it adds up. Anyway, it's on with the show. It's Tony D'Angelo here on 30 with Tony. We are cooking mama. We'll be right back right after this. Now you take Sally, and I'll take Sue, and we're gonna rock away all our blues. Come on, come on, let me show you where it's at. Come on, come on, let me show you where it's at. Come on, come on, let me show you where it's at. The name of the place is I like it like that. Hello, fun seekers. 
Since we like to mix fun with business, please enjoy another video classic clip, courtesy of the producers of 30 with Tony. Hi movie fans. Today is another classic clip from White Heat, made in 1949. In this scene, Cody Jarrett, played by James Cagney, busts out of prison to exact revenge on his wife Verna played by Virginia Mayo, for being involved in the death of his mob boss mother. back. Now tell me you're glad to see me. Well, you say it low, so nobody can hear. Cody, oh, I'm so glad to see you. I've been praying you'd come back. I couldn't stand any longer. I was running away. From Big Ed? Yeah. What's the matter? Don't you like him? No, no. Maybe you shouldn't have teamed up with him in the first place, huh? He couldn't help it, Cody. He said if I didn't go away with him, he'd have you killed. <laughs> All I wanted was for you to come back. That's the truth. I love you, Cody. I love you. Let Ma die. No. You know, didn't you raise a finger to help her? You just stood there and watched Big Ed kill her. Huh? I tell you, you got it wrong, Cody. Maybe you even thought it was funny. An old woman taking on a guy like that, huh? No. I tried to warn her. But he caught me and beat me. Then when Ma came, he was waiting for her and he... I... I can't tell you. Tell me. He got her in the back. Is he in there now? Yeah. But you gotta be careful, Cody. He's got the house rigged up like a trap. He can't get in unless I tell you how. Well, thanks, Kimisabis. Thanks for staying with us. You know, I have uh, a number of people who will come to me from time to time. I'm flattered by the attention and they will say, Tony, can you take a look at this? And uh, what do you think? Or what's your opinion? Or something like that. My regret many times is that I can't give these things the attention that I would like for a whole bunch of other considerations and commitments that I will not bore you with. But uh, every once in a while, something will come that, I mean, it all deserves further attention, but something that I believe is so egregious when you look at the operation of the state as an example, you just think that, you know, you got to share it. You got to tell people what's happening. So my very good Twitter friend and very good friend, Mark from West Hartford, asked a, I it, what I thought about what was happening with the situation, you know, in and around West Hartford with the Bridge Family Center. And I was very honest with Mark as I endeavor to be with everybody. You know, if you tell the truth, you never have to think about who you told what to. It's it's, it's marvelous. Let me tell you, it's uh, it'll set you free, really. And that's what the Bible says. But anyway, I said, look, Mark, I'm be very honest with you. It's not something I've really focused on. I've read your 
tweets. I paid some attention. I think it's terrible. Uh, and just a little bit of the news reading I've done, but, uh, he, but he said, uh, could you please look at that? And I said, well, OK, you know, um, I respect his judgment and let's give it a look. Is So I said to myself and I've done some research here on this subject of the Bridge Family Center. And there's been a lot written about it. There's been a lot of back and forth. Um, there's been a lot of accusations and things. And it's uh, the one thing I think everybody connected with this agrees on is no one says there's that this is a positive situation at all. You know, everybody acknowledges there are problems. The problems are really exacerbated by people blaming people for the other, uh, the, saying that the other person's responsible for the problem and not them. But I want to give you a little background. Perhaps you're not, uh, you were like me, you weren't as familiar. And what I endeavor to do here today, this afternoon, is um, Hartford Current has written several articles on this, other newspapers and have written articles on this. I don't want to do what they did. There's no point in my doing that. You could read that for yourself. You can make your own determination and your own decision relative to that. But my function as I see it, and I explain this to Mark, is I can't do anything here unless I could bring to the people, to the audience, the, the, the multi-thousand audience on the Lee Elsie show. Uh, it's not just my work. It's the work of many others much more so than I, uh, especially our paterfamilias, Lee Elsie. And, you know, I can only, it's only valuable to me if I can bring you something that no one else is bringing. And that's what I'm going to endeavor to do this afternoon. So allow me to elucidate here uh, a little bit. And I'm just going to go over here to my uh, my screen share. And uh, I'm just clumsy today for some reason. And I don't, quite know why. Let me just locate my Meser. Here's my Meser. And we're going to do a screen share. And we're going to go over to here. And here we go. Thank you for your patience with my technological incompetence. This is an article, Hartford Current. This ran, let me see. Okay, this was March 1st. And it's a story about a second girl alleging a rape at a DCF girl shelter. Permanent psychological and emotional harm. Now, I'm going to read down here a little bit just to give us all a little bit of background. Um, a second teenage girl has sued the Bridge Family Center, claiming she was raped by a worker as scandal played Harrington Shelter for Troubled Adolescent Girls. In the suit filed, actually, this would be two Wednesdays ago in Hartford Superior Court, the then 14-year-old girl says that during her time at the shelter, i.e. the bridge shelter, from March to May of 2023, she was raped and sexually assaulted by a facility employee and has suffered significant physical and emotional harm. One point of note here, which uh, if I neglected to say this, I want to say this now. I'm not going to offer opinion here as I go through this. I'm going to show you established fact, and you're going to draw your own conclusions, and I'll have some concluding remarks on this entire segment, on this entire endeavor. Um, going, um, this state-funded shelter was shut down last fall, and uh, it became part of a statewide network of so-called star homes for children and adolescents who need temporary shelter, usually after neglect or abuse at home. The Harwinton facility operated on a contract from the State of De Department of Children and Families for more than a decade. Um, so it's not a, as uh, the author of this article says, a DCF shelter. No, it, it, it is a nonprofit not a part of the state. That, of course, if you've followed what we've been doing on the Lee Elsie show, uh, brings a whole host of other problems because you cannot FOI inside the nonprofit because the legislature made it that way. 
you know, and, and basically that's the Yukon Foundation, that's Advanced ET. Now we got another butte here with this one. I said I wouldn't offer opinion, but basically what it basically comes down to is in the normal world, that's called racketeering. Let's move on. Um, the uh, On Thursday, the Department of Children and Families assured state lawmakers that it had overhauled its system. Um, and it's a lot of back and forth between the child advocate of the state and, 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 and. But basically, there is bad stuff. The uh, alleged, the uh, issues with this poor girl, uh, the... Uh, it's a mess from what I am seeing and what I'm reading. The bridge, uh, one thing not to blow over, there are three lawsuits against the bridge about abuse and neglect. They are in the court record. They are all brought by, uh, of course, the agreed parties, but they're represented by a um, attorney in Hartford. His name is Timothy O'Keefe. They're on the state website. If you uh, want to take a look. I don't think uh, I could bore you to tears and have you read um, read the complaints. You should. It'll tell you what's happening. And I always challenge you, especially in the state of Connecticut, don't believe what anybody in the media is telling you. Not that they're all telling you lies, but go to the documents and read the documents and see what's happening because the omissions and the cover-ups and the sleight of hand and all that, some days are just absolutely staggering. Um, but uh, I, uh, I I don't allege that here in this particular article uh, with um, the Hartford Current, but basically it is not a good scene. Now, this is the second one. It's been, you could read about everything taking place and no one really says that what's taking place is a good situation. Now, as I said to Mark from West Hartford, what is not being shown here that the state, the corporate media, and all the people out there um, are doing and all the finger pointing and all the you know horrible things that have been alleged going back and forth. My first inclination, which no one did, is look at the money. How much does the state of Connecticut pay for really you know, from what I can see is a problem and everybody agrees it is a problem. And no one in this whole group of Commissioner Vanessa Durante's, uh, the Department of Children and Families, the bridge, no one seems to be able to fix the problem. Welcome to Connecticut, the state of unfixed perpetual problems. Okay, so my first question is, what is the amount of money that the state of Connecticut is paying these people to do whatever they're doing. Again, I'm keeping my opinion to myself. How about $61.1 million? $61.1 million over the past, I believe this is 12 years, to do what they do, whatever they do, which everybody is saying they ain't doing well. There's a lot of excuses. There's a lot of you know, no one, uh, the bridge every once in a while will come out and say, oh, we're doing these wonderful things, but it's not our fault if we do bad things. The people in the town are furious. You've got three lawsuits and, uh, you know, Lord knows what else is going to be happening. But basically $61.1 million, and I think there's also $150,000 to the bridge of West Hartford. And to make it worse, to make it entirely worse, we can't get our hands on that. We can't get at the minutes. We can't get at the record. State business is being done. Children are being housed on state dollars, and we can't get at that. I mean, honestly, truthfully, I mean, if if I were to be reincarnated, if there were such a thing as reincarnation, and there was no liability for sin, and somebody would say to me, you know, Tony, uh, what kind of a gangster do you want to be? What kind of a rotten individual, rapist, thief, murderer do you want to be? It's like, hey, connect me with the state of Connecticut bureaucracy. You know, this this is, as I said I wouldn't offer my opinion, but that will send you through the roof. I mean, $61.1 million, you know, for this, for three lawsuits, more state dollars, and, you know, for children getting hurt. Now, at the head of every ship, 
there is a captain. And the head of the Bridge Family Center is a lady called, or her name is Margaret Hahn. And we're going to look at her here for at a, at a second. I just want to, I've got a lot of documents here in the queue. And here is a copy of the 2022 Form 990 Charitable Return for the Bridge Family Center. Now, actually, show you the kind of money they get. Make sure to go back to page eight. This is 2021, the fiscal year end is 6-30-2022. That always drives everybody crazy in nonprofit practice with fiscal years. But they get in, you know, gimmies, $8.7, $8.8 .8 million. You saw the $61 million earlier. So a lot of money goes through this thing for what they're doing. Now, go down over here a little bit. Let's go back to page eight. And we look at our key people. Margaret Hahn, H-A-N-N, -N, has been the executive director of The Bridge. If you look her up on LinkedIn, it's kind of your typical LinkedIn page for 30 some odd years. I will say this about organizational people. People that have been, this is a, this is not a statement for or against Ms. Hahn, but people who are in organizations for decades more often than not, are not part of the solution. They are part of the status quo, oftentimes at best, or they are part of the problem because they're not bringing new ideas as they do things. They're not bringing other experiences generally, not talking about Ms. Hahn. But that to me is always a concern. Um, I know when I would go on interviews and I would sit with partners that have been in firms for um, years and years and years, my concern was, is are they going to be open to new ways of doing things? Generally, they're not. Generally, as people get up into the food chain of higher whatever, you know, they get pretty comfortable. So I'm not saying that about Ms. Han, but draw your own conclusions. She's been there 30 some odd years, and her total compensation is running about $250,000. And this taken from a you know, shall we say a uh, $61.1 million gimme from the state of Connecticut. Other people well compensated, Michael Rulnick, 131, uh, maybe close to $150,000, excuse me. Hilde Fontana, the director of finance, she's up about $175,000. I'm sure it's higher now. Uh, Doreen Tarasio, director of development, up about $110,000. Now, when you look at high compensation and ostensible failure, tells you something's wrong. Tells you something's happening there that's not right. It also tells you, you know, you have a question there about accountability because it's like, you're paying these people, you're paying them good money, but this is what's happening. So is it possible that you know is it there for what what are they doing you know are they part of the solution or are they part of the problem so during the uh shall we say the hubbub of um you know getting rid of this facility in harlington now i'm just a guy reading i'm just a guy looking at public information ms han gave testimony to the state now she didn't show up and uh, this is dated going back here. Um, none of the state-run news articles linked to this. It took me a while to find it. Um, but but it was posted, I believe, by the 61 News Network. And uh, she says, I'm submitting written testimony to these proceedings. Um, but she says, curiously enough, while I would like to be there in person due to pending litigation and the advice of counsel, I will not be in attendance. My first question is, why are they having her write three pages? You know, what what is the point of that? I mean, she's either going to give testimony or she's going to say, you know, I'm going to plead my uh, my Fifth Amendment rights. And she goes on and on and on. You know, my impressions about re you can read this. Um, it, it'll take you a while to find it, but you can get to it. 
about the history of the bridges and you know actually uh she um when you read this thing um she talks about the uh shall we say the continuing saga um she does not really let me just read a little of it for you um she does not like the comments of the Harwinton town leaders. A town leader in Harwinton has said the largest percentage of gun owners uh, in our states, our girls need to be mindful of the fact if they are on a neighbor's property. Perhaps this person is, you know, somewhat had it with the facility and the lack of, you know, bureaucratic collision and incredible amounts of money going for ostensibly little result. Um and someone else called the girls prostitutes. Well, maybe that's not nice, but I don't think they'll call them uh, angels of mercy. Um, recently, a Harwinton volunteer ambulance worker told the media that the Harwinton Star program was under a state police investigation and accused the bridge of being involved in human trafficking. I can't say if that's true or false. All I can say is this is all indicative to all the problems. But no one can really deny here that tons of money are being given to what effectively is a mess. I mean, Ms. Han is even saying that there are issues. She's blaming it on other people in her testimony. But what is Ms. Han's mission? Nonprofits must be a priority in the state of Connecticut. Um, providers in Connecticut are continually being asked to serve very complicated youth. I mean, Ms. Hahn, $61 million. I mean, I think I could make a go on that. We do so without hesitation because this is our commission commitment to our missions. And, you know, we don't have enough money to pay staff. COLA increases have been sporadic and not kept up with inflation. I mean, not for nothing, Ms. Hahn, but you're making a quarter of a million dollars here. I mean, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of people in the state of Connecticut would love to have an insular, you know, nonprofit job protected by the state of Connecticut and make a quarter of a million dollars. I mean, I don't know if you really can claim the poor mouth here. And then she says, due to pending litigation, again, my comments are filtered. I, I am not in a position to judge what Ms. Hahn is saying is true untrue, north, south, east, west. But what I am seeing is she is getting an excellent rate of compensation. And so are the people in her organization. The state is feeding this thing $61.1 million and people are suing uh, based upon, you know, dangers to young women and young girls. That's Those are un, undisputable facts. So, Look at all the people involved in this thing, the bridge, the legislature, uh, the um, the state, the administrative state, the DCF, and it's going from bad to worse. Now, when you look at what's happening, we have members in our legislature who are on the committee people with legislative authority, people, if need be, with subpoena authority, people who could move upon the government and our governor, King Ned Lamont, the unaccountable, who can do this himself based on his executive powers, which he has used. Now, one little twerp state-run news reporter, I'm not going to embarrass him here, uh, if he ever comes near me, I'll embarrass him publicly. But he was saying, well, the government just didn't have that kind of power. Look, you got some idiot right now in the Department of Environment. <laughs> Connecticut is a sea of acronyms. Um, the DEEP, Department of Environment and Protecting the Environment. Katie, <laughs> Katie Dykes, right? Um, the who wants to institute climate change emergencies and give the governor power to do it, like a COVID emergency. I mean, I see a great cloud. Um, pollution. Everybody's got to stay off the roads. This is the kind of power 
that is vested in the governor. He could do something, but I want to show you these people. I want you to know them because every single one of them is falling down on the job. Why aren't they yelling and screaming and calling? Children's lives are at stake. Liz Linehan, CC Mayor, Sarah Kitt, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Julie Kushner, I guess she's too busy sticking restaurants for, uh, uh, for, for high wages for people that really like the system the way it is. Ann Dauphines, Lisa Seminera, Anwar, Tom Arnone, Pat Boy. Hey, Pat, nice to see you, at least on paper. Don't see much of you otherwise. Uh, Christine Cohen, Rockin' Robin Comey, Rick Hayes. Well, I guess you're getting out. Brian Lanui. Gail Mesto Francesco, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Ronald Napoli, William Pizzuto, Kadeem Roberts, Robert Sanchez, and Mary Wielander. Hi, Mary. We've had a couple of discussions in the past. Why aren't these people going to the governor to say, use your executive powers, take control of this thing? There's a problem here. We don't know what the problem is. We don't know who's responsible. Money's going out. There's three lawsuits, and we're all going to look at it and wring our hands and say, you know, the state of Connecticut bureaucracy can solve it. Now, again, I think I'll stop the share here. Um, but I do want you to pay attention to these people because these people are in turn responsible. Mark from West Hartford often brings up the mayor of West Hartford. I believe her name is Sherry Cantor and the police chief, uh, Chief Riddick, if I've got that correctly, and say, you know, why aren't you responsible? Well, they're board members. Yeah, it's, it's happening. They should say something. They are adult leaders in the community. They are political in nature. You know, this all appears to be happening without their you know, shall we say, uh, concern, you know, but uh, we do have a good Samaritan law for nonprofits in the state of Connecticut. That's a whole different thing to get into, but it is pretty shameful. But when you're talking shameful, I'll stop the share right here. You're talking Connecticut. And what have I done? I've just shown you the facts. I, this is armchair research looking at tax returns, looking at the state checkbook, looking at the legislators who, you know, on this day are nowhere to be found concerning this issue. And it is undeniable there is a mess. It is undeniable. The courts will decide if there were rapes. I'm not going to do that. I don't have enough background. You could read the articles, the other what the other people wrote about that. But this is, when people look at this, this is the thing, you know, it, this is where politicians, I'm talking all parties, have got to be deaf, drunk, dumb, blind, and dishonest. People look at this. People will see this video. People look on Jesse Waters, who did um, actually this past Friday a national piece on the Bridgeport election and say, Connecticut's a crock. Connecticut's nonsense. Connecticut is probably one of the places where I wouldn't go. This is what the government is. This is what the system is. And I mean, you got a whole lot of characters in this movie who basically are doing, you know, nobody here, nobody in the whole mess, it's inarguable, is a part of the solution. But kids are being, you know, money's going out. My taxpayer money's going out. You know, I was on a call on Friday with an unjustified collection action where, you know, I'm listen, I'm not going to say that because that may be a show for another time. But, you know, I mean, they want my money and they want my client's money to go pay for these messes. And then they say, give me your vote. Contribute to my political party. I'll make everything right. Oh, my Lord. Listen, this is the administrative state in Connecticut. And politician, administrator, coward, it's about time you did something about it. We're now talking kids, but that doesn't really seem to matter to you, does it? Um, you know, again, come here, challenge me. I'll open the floor to you and... We need answers. And the longer you don't give them, the worse it's going to get. This ain't going away, and neither am I. It's Tony D'Angelo here on 30 with Tony. We'll be back with the close of the show right after this.
Zombies, thanks for staying with us, and thank you for hanging with me in two very detailed and difficult and unfortunately very necessary subjects that we need to be looking at in the state of Connecticut. I really do appreciate you. Without you, there would be no me doing this, and uh, you are my inspiration to get out and do this every single week. But anyway, time to share a funny story with you. There's a kid in the center of town with a bunch of fish, and he's out yelling, Damn fish! Damn fish! Damn fish! And the pastor of the community church walks over and says, Young man, why are you cursing? It's not a good thing to do. You're not glorifying our Lord. And the kid says, No, 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 pastor. These are damn fish. I caught them by the dam. The pastor says, Oh, okay, I get it. It's like, gee, I like damn fish. Can I buy some from you? The kid says, sure. Well, the kid gets his money, goes away happy. The pastor goes away happy, brings the fish home to his wife and says, here are some good fish that you could have for dinner. I bought them in the town square. So the family's having dinner, mom, dad, the two kids. And the kids have been brought up very, 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 you know, for lack of a better term, religiously. And the pastor's son says, this is really great fish. What kind of fish is it? And Pastor turns over and says, son, that's damn fish. And his son is like so excited. It says, hey, dad, I never heard you curse before. And he knocks over the butter into his mother's $100,000 skirt. And she said, Bobby, you ruined my skirt. Whole family, it's taking a journey into hell. Doo doo, damn fish. Anyway, <laughs> it's Tony D'Angelo here on 30 with Tony. Thank you so much for being with us. Kimasabis, we'll be back next week with some more stuff. I do appreciate your being here. When you get the information, go out and make yourself a committee of one and do something with it. Make a better world for yourself and for others. As Dick Clark would say in American Bandstand, so long. <laughs>